This video continues our discussion of the guidelines for the response paper assignment. In this particular video, our concern will be with the explanation section of the response papers. Recall that the purpose of the explanation section is only to explain the argument you are writing about. Of course, later in your paper, you will also criticize the argument, but that comes later in your analysis section. In the explanation section, you are simply informing your reader about the argument that the author makes in the reading, the argument that you will again eventually criticize. As such, my primary aim here will be to provide you with some guidance for how to identify the conclusion of an argument, identify its premises and logical structure, and explain the reasons the author provides for why we should believe that those premises are true. However, before diving into these details, I first want to briefly discuss what it means to succeed at explaining a philosophical argument. In other words, how do we know if we have done this properly? When grading your explanation section, I will evaluate whether you have provided a complete explanation of the argument in question. On the response paper guidelines, I define a complete explanation in the following way. Completely explaining a philosophical argument requires explaining everything an intelligent person who is unacquainted with philosophy, this class, or the argument you are writing about would need to fully comprehend that argument. On this point, I think it is important and helpful to have the right sort of audience in mind when you are in the process of writing. Although I, your professor, will be the one who eventually reads your paper, you should not write as though that is the case. The reason for this is because I already know and understand the argument you are writing about. So if after reading your paper, I can report that I understand the argument, well, that doesn't really tell us much about the quality of your explanation. Instead, I want you to imagine that you are writing this paper for a person who is intelligent and perceptive, someone who is interested in learning about philosophy, but has never taken a class in philosophy before, or who has never done this particular reading. What would you have to do to ensure that this person understood what was being said in the argument? Well, you would have to define all important terms, clearly identify the conclusion of the argument, explain what is meant by that conclusion, and take the reader step by step through the logical progression of the argument. In other words, to put it more generally, your approach would need to be both very detailed and systematic. For this reason, that is precisely the approach you need to take when writing the explanation section of your paper. Write as if your audience has never done the reading, and after you have completed the first draft, really go back and read your paper again, imagining that you are someone who has never encountered this argument before. And ask the question, would such a person, from what you have written, be able to fully understand and comprehend the argument. The reason I emphasize this is because if you can provide a complete explanation defined in this way, then it would also have to be the case that you yourself understand the argument in a thorough and detailed way. And after all, that really is the very point of the assignment. In what follows, I will provide specific guidance for how this can be achieved. To begin, we should take a broad view of what you need to accomplish in order to completely explain a philosophical argument. Specifically, a proper explanation of a philosophical argument will be able to provide an answer to three questions. These questions and the relationship between them is displayed in the diagram on your screen that comes from the response paper guidelines. The first question you need to ask in order to explain a philosophical argument is the following. What is the conclusion of the argument? What specific claim is the author arguing for? 
Although it may seem counterintuitive, since it might seem like consideration of the conclusion should come last, really, before you write anything or outline any premises of the argument, you first need to know exactly what the conclusion of the argument is. As we will see in more detail shortly, this is because knowing the conclusion of the argument sets the stage for everything else you're going to do. Before you can understand the path that the author takes, that is, before you can understand the premises and logical structure that the author employs, you first need to know where the author is going, what the author's destination is. Then, once you have identified the specific and precise conclusion the author argues for, you can begin to outline what premises the author uses to get to that conclusion. Now, this brings us to question two. What are the premises of the argument? What are the fundamental claims that the author uses to establish that the conclusion is correct? This point should be familiar from our previous lessons on logic. The premises are the reasons given for why the conclusion is true. So, once we know what the conclusion of the argument is, of course the next step is to ask, what are the premises? Once you've identified the premises and conclusion of the argument, you might think that your work is done. After all, don't the premises and conclusion constitute the entirety of the argument? However, there's an additional step that still needs to be taken. This is described in question three and brings up a point we have not yet touched upon. Question three asks, what reason does the author give for us to think that the premises are true? In other words, what support is there for the premises? It is great to outline a set of premises from which a conclusion can be validly inferred. However, we still need to know why think that those premises themselves are correct? What reason does the author give for us to believe that these premises are true? This is critical because this is primarily where philosophical debate takes place. In many cases, disagreement about a philosophical argument really concerns not whether the premises lead to the conclusion, but is concerned with whether the premises themselves are true. So, it is important for your reader to understand the reasons the author has for believing that each premise of the argument is correct. As we will see, there are certain complications involved with each of these questions, and we will delve into these matters shortly in the rest of this video. However, this should provide you with a general outline of what you need to accomplish in your explanation section. When explaining a philosophical argument, the first thing you should do is attempt to outline the reasoning that the author uses to reach his or her conclusion. That is, you should address the first two questions that were discussed in the previous section of this video. This requires that you identify the premises and conclusions of the argument. In this section of the video, I'm going to provide you with an example of how to do this using the article Seven Arguments Against Extra Credit by Christopher Pines that was also one of your assigned readings for this week. So, if you have not already done so, it will be helpful for you to have read the required section from that reading before continuing on with this video. Specifically, what I'm going to do here is take one of the arguments from this article, which Pines entitles the failure in conception argument and is found on pages 204 and 205. I'm going to take that argument and put it into standard form by identifying its premises and conclusions. This will set the stage not just for completing the rest of the explanation section of the paper, but also for completing the analysis section of the paper as well. As mentioned previously, the first thing to do when explaining a philosophical argument is to identify the conclusion of that argument. Furthermore, we do not just want to specify the conclusion in a vague or general way. 
Rather, we want to nail down precisely what the author is arguing for. This is because, among many other reasons, having an accurate and precise understanding of the author's conclusion will enable us to more readily identify the premises the author uses to reason to that conclusion. So, where is the conclusion of the argument found? In this particular case, Pine states the exact conclusion of this argument toward the end of the section that discusses the failure in conception argument. Pines explains that, So, in the long run, it is better to write exams that actually test what you want and nothing more. Bonus questions aren't good for the test taker, and they aren't good for the person assigning the grades either. They fail as a concept of extra credit for the best students whose grades cannot be raised. And they either raise all grades or are ineffective if they are too easy. Now first, we should take note of the conclusion indicator, so. This tells us that what he is about to state has been shown to be true based upon what he has said previously. This means and indicates to us that the premises for this conclusion will be found in the preceding paragraphs. Now, what is the precise conclusion of the argument that Pines is explaining here? Is Pines arguing here that extra credit is bad merely in some vague or general way? Well, no, he isn't. He tells us that in this argument, he is aiming to establish that one of two things must be true about extra credit questions on exams. It is either the case that such questions fail as a concept of extra credit, or it is the case that such questions raise all grades, or that they merely result in grade inflation. So, the conclusion of this argument is that the use of extra credit questions on exams, depending on the kind of extra credit question we are talking about, will inevitably result in one of these outcomes. As you can see, I have placed this conclusion into my argument outline. I have rendered the conclusion as, exam bonus questions either result in grade inflation or fail to qualify as extra credit. This is a more succinct statement of the conclusion that Pines is attempting to establish in this argument. Now before we continue on to identify the premises of the argument, we should take a moment and pause to consider further how identifying the conclusion of the argument will help us going forward. This conclusion sets out two possible outcomes that could result from using exam bonus questions. What would the author have to do to show that this conclusion is correct? What would the author have to do to show that one of these two possible outcomes must inevitably result? To understand this point, let's consider the following hypothetical example. Suppose your friend says to you, I don't know exactly how tomorrow is going to go, but I think it is either going to be a really good day or a really bad day. Suppose you ask your friend to explain further and to justify this claim. You would not know exactly what your friend was going to say, but you should already have some expectation about the way in which she was going to reason. You would expect her first to describe a way that tomorrow could go that would be great, and then another way that tomorrow could go that would be awful. Perhaps she might say, for example, it is possible that tomorrow I will get the promotion I've been wanting at work, and then I will have reason to celebrate. Or it is also a realistic possibility that I do not get the promotion, I have an uncontrollable, angry outburst, I get fired, and then I cannot pay my rent. What she has done here is describe two different realistic ways that tomorrow could go, each of which would lead to a different outcome, and such reasoning would let her conclude that tomorrow will either be great or awful. The point here is that we should expect the same sort of thing in this particular case. Pines has claimed that exam bonus questions have one of two possible outcomes. So, he owes us an explanation of how exam bonus questions might lead to either of those possibilities. 
thinking in this way in which we work backward from the conclusion to the premises that we expect to find in the argument is of critical importance when outlining the argument's structure. This is because doing so orients us toward what we should be looking for when we identify the argument's premises. In this case, the questions we need to answer are the following. What are the two different ways that exam bonus questions could be? And why do these different types of exam bonus questions lead to the two possible outcomes that Pines has identified? That is, why do they either lead to grade inflation or fail to qualify as extra credit in the first place? These are the questions we should keep in mind when attempting to identify the premises of his argument. So, what are the various ways that an exam bonus question could be structured? Pines gives us an answer to this early in this section. He states, We must first look at how these types of bonus questions are constructed. When it comes to the failure in conception argument for bonus questions on exams, there are two extremes, easy and hard. Pines is claiming here that exam bonus questions must either be of an easy difficulty level or a hard difficulty level. And I have made this the first premise of the standard form argument outline. Notice how this sets the stage for finding the remaining premises of the argument. We now know that Pines believes there are two types of bonus questions, easy and hard. Furthermore, we know that he wants to establish that the use of exam bonus questions will have one of two outcomes, grade inflation or failing to qualify as extra credit. So, what is now missing is some explanation of how the kinds of bonus questions identified in premise 1 lead to the possible outcomes identified in the conclusion. More specifically, we need to ask, what would be the consequence of having easy exam bonus questions? And what would be the consequence of having hard bonus questions? By finding the answers to these questions, we can find the missing links in the argument. Let's consider what Pine says will result from easy bonus questions. He explains this point in the following two statements. First, he says that, if the bonus question is so easy that the vast majority of students will get the answer right and earn the bonus points, then it is just like scaling an exam score set upward. In the next paragraph, he reiterates that, Without a principled way to justify the easy version of the bonus questions, what occurs is grade inflation. Nearly all the grades are raised for no good reason except for the point of giving a bonus question. To sum all of this up more succinctly, we can say that Pines is claiming that the following conditional statement is true. If exam bonus questions are easy, then those questions will result in grade inflation. I have made this premise two of the argument outline. The structure of the argument is, as a whole is now beginning to take shape. Bonus questions can either be easy or they can be hard. And now we have a claim about what will result from a bonus question being easy. Furthermore, we should notice that the result that is claimed to follow from the use of easy bonus questions is also one of the outcomes identified in the conclusion. Pines wants to argue that one possible result of bonus questions is grade inflation, and the scenario under which that occurs is the scenario in which the bonus questions have an easy difficulty level. Based on the structure of the argument, we should expect that the final premise of the argument would establish a link between a bonus question being a hard and that question failing to qualify as extra credit. And in fact, this is precisely what Pines tells us in the next paragraph. He states that in the case of hard bonus questions, the question would actually fail as an instance of extra credit. I have made this the third premise of the argument and rendered it as, if exam bonus questions are hard, then those questions will fail to qualify as extra credit. Now we have a validly structured argument. 
Premise 1 outlines two possible options, easy or hard bonus questions. P2 and P3 claim that some result will follow from those possibilities, either great inflation or failing to qualify as extra credit. And then the conclusion validly infers that one of those results must be true when exam bonus questions are used. So, our standard form argument outline is now complete. Now, one thing you may notice here is that there are a number of claims in the passage that contains the third premise that I ignored for the purpose of the argument outline. To see what I mean, let's take a look just at the last sentence of this passage. This sentence reads, so it would actually fail as an instance of extra credit because it doesn't satisfy the criterion set forth in two to increase a student's grade. You might wonder why I didn't take into account what Pine says after the because, the point about how hard bonus questions fail to raise a student's grade when I was outlining the third premise of the argument. This is a good question to ask, and it gets to one of the more difficult aspects of constructing an argument outline. When identifying the premises of the argument, we are attempting to identify the broadest, most general, most fundamental claims that the author uses to establish his or her conclusion. That means, for the moment, we are setting aside the reasons the author has for believing that these claims are true. Or, to put it in terms of the three questions we examined previously, for the moment, we are setting aside consideration of the support for those premises. Now, let's return to the present passage. The premise being put forth here is that hard bonus questions fail as an instance of extra credit. The support for that premise, or the reason why the author thinks we should believe it is true, is that such questions fail to raise a student's grade. Now, how do we know this? Well, one way we can tell is that by looking at the inference indicators. The conclusion indicator so and the premise indicator because tell us that the latter part of the sentence is being given as a reason to believe that the first part of the sentence is true. That is, the latter part of the sentence is the reason given for why this particular premise of the argument is true. It is providing support for that premise. Now, the next step in explaining a philosophical argument will be to explain the support given for each of the premises. In fact, again, you'll recall this is the third question we outlined previously. However, at present, we are not worrying about the support for each of the premises or asking what reason there is to believe that each is true. For example, we are not asking whether all bonus questions really must be easy or hard, or whether easy questions necessarily result in great inflation, or whether hard questions really do fail to qualify as extra credit. Questions of this sort will be pushed aside until we are ready to consider how the author supports each premise. At present, our only concern is with constructing a standard form outline of the argument that clearly communicates the logical structure of the argument. Now that we have a standard form outline of the argument, let's examine what role this plays in the explanation section of your paper. On your screen is the demonstration paper I have been writing on Pine's article to illustrate to you how your paper should work. Thus far, I have written an introductory paragraph that introduces the topic and states the thesis that Pine ar Pines argues for. Now that I have a standard form outline, I can include that in my paper as well. Here, I tell the reader that below is an outline of Pine's reasoning, and then I provide the outline. Of course, as I began to explain above, Having a premise conclusion format of the argument is very important, but it is not sufficient for completely explaining a philosophical argument. We still need to know how the author supports each of these premises. And this is the topic that I will turn to in the next section of this video.
Once you have identified the premises and conclusion of the argument, your next task is to explain how the author supports each of these premises. Therefore, we should begin by reviewing what it is that we mean by support for the premises. Thus far, we have outlined Pine's argument in standard form with three premises and one conclusion. With this outline in place, we can understand the structure of the argument and we can see that the argument is valid. But that still leaves us with the following question. Is the argument sound? And determine whether the argument is sound, we need to know whether the premises are true or false. That is, we need to ask for each separate premise, what reason do I have to believe that P1 is true, that P2 is true, or that P3 is true? The answer to each of these questions, the reasons given to persuade the audience that each premise is true, is what we mean by support for the premises. So when I say, when explaining a philosophical argument, that you are required to provide support for the premises, I am saying that you need to explain the reasons the author gives for why we should accept each premise of the argument as being correct. Support for a premise is simply an answer to the question, why think this premise is true? Now you might ask at this point, how will providing support for the premises fit into the overall structure of my paper? To understand this, let's return to the demonstration paper that I've been using as an example. Again, you can see that we have the standard form argument outline of Pine's argument, and following this argument outline is when you would provide the support for each premise. You can see that I have a sentence that indicates to the reader which premise of the argument I'm going to explain. I say, I will begin with premise one, Pines gives the following reasons for premise two, and then let's consider Pine's argument for premise three. Of course, you shouldn't think that you need to use these phrases word for word, but it is good to have sentences that tell the reader precisely what premise you are about to explain and provide support for. Then, following this, you will spend some time explaining the reasons the author gives in support of that premise. For the purposes of illustration, I am not going to write out explicitly how I would do this if I were really writing this paper. Instead, in a moment, I will be talking through the support for each premise of this argument and highlighting the various points that I would make sure to cover if I really were completing this assignment. However, at this stage, I do think it is worth reiterating again what I am looking for in your explanation section. When providing support for each of the premises, I want to see that you paraphrase the author in a way that does not just regurgitate their thoughts, but shows your own understanding by using your own words and your own examples. I want to see that you pay close attention to the text and provide in-text citations whenever you attribute a claim to an author. Furthermore, your explanation should be sufficiently thorough and detailed that someone who is not already acquainted with the argument would be able to understand it. That is, you should provide what I call a complete explanation of the argument. It will be important to keep these points in mind as I talk you through the support for each premise of the argument in what follows. Let's begin with premise one. Below is the passage where Pines explains this premise. He states, to understand this, we must first look at how these types of bonus questions are constructed. When it comes to the failure and conception argument for bonus questions on exams, there are two extremes, easy and hard. The claim made by premise one is that bonus questions can either be easy or hard in terms of their difficulty level. However, one thing that should jump out to you here about this passage is that although Pines does make this claim, he does not really provide any explicit support for it. He does not really argue for this claim. And you might ask, why is this? And when this happens, what should you do in such a situation? And this is not necessarily an uncommon thing. And so for that reason, we should think further about why this happens. 
In many cases, an author will make a claim but not explicitly argue for that claim because the author takes that claim to be obvious and in need of no further argument or explanation. Now, in certain situations, that is true. But in other cases, something that the author seems to think is obviously true may not really be so. It might be a claim that really should warrant further discussion and further justification. In fact, to a certain extent, I think that is the case here. As we will see shortly, I think there are good reasons to think that premise one is true, but these reasons are not so obvious that they need not be mentioned. I think Pines actually would have improved his argument by making those reasons a little bit more explicit. For our purposes, however, the more important question is, what should you do in such a circumstance? What should you do when the author you are writing about leaves one or more of the premises of the argument unsupported? Here your role is to think critically and carefully about what reasons could be offered in support of this premise. Even if the author does not explicitly state those reasons, presumably some such reasons do exist, and it will be your job to explain those reasons to your reader to the best of your ability. In this case, the explanation I would provide on behalf of premise one would go something like the following. Someone might object to premise one because there is another possible option. This person might say that there could be medium difficulty level bonus questions. I would grant that, hypothetically speaking, this is true. I can imagine a professor putting medium difficulty level bonus questions on an exam. However, while this is technically possible, it is not clear what the point of doing so would be. Medium difficulty level questions are probably just like the normal credit questions that are already in the main portion of the exam. But extra credit questions should presumably be offering something different. In the case of easy questions, maybe it's just an easy way to raise a student's grade. In the case of difficult questions, perhaps it is the opportunity to challenge one's comprehension of the material. Thus, it seems that there would be no point to medium difficulty extra credit questions. So, it seems reasonable to suppose that bonus questions must be either easy or hard. And of course, that is just the claim that is made in premise one. What I have offered here is support for premise one that, while it does not appear explicitly in the author's writing, does make a plausible case for why we should accept premise one. Doing this required that I think actively and critically about the points made in the argument. Furthermore, in doing this, I have actually strengthened the author's argument and worked to present it in the strongest way possible to my reader. This is one thing I will look for when grading your explanation section. Do you caricature the author's argument so it will be easier to criticize later on? Or do you work to present that argument in the most fair and robust fashion that you possibly can? Now, let's consider P2 of the argument. This premise claims that easy questions result in great inflation. And Pines gives the following relatively straightforward argument for why this premise is true. He states that, if the bonus question is so easy that the vast majority of the students will get the answer right and earn the bonus points, then it is just like scaling an exam score set upward. Then later he adds that a high tide raises all ships in the same way that an easy bonus question raises nearly all grades. Without a principled way to justify the easy version of the bonus questions, what occurs is grade inflation. Nearly all the grades are raised for no good reason except for the point of giving a bonus question. If a question is easy, then presumably nearly every student in the class should be able to answer it correctly. If that is the case, then the question does not really effectively measure a student's learning, or separate those students who have mastery over the material from those who do not. As such, its sole purpose would seem to be to raise a student's grade, and as Pine argues here, that would seem to qualify as grade inflation. 
While this is a relatively simple and straightforward argument, there's still one further point to make here. The claim made in premise two is that easy questions lead to great inflation. That may very well be true, but to adequately evaluate that claim, we need to know what great inflation means. Pines alludes to a definition of great inflation in the section of his paper just prior to where he explains the failure in conception argument. There he states that, so if a student could add points to her total and increase her grade, then this is ipso facto great inflation. What has occurred in these types of cases is that grading as a measure of learning is undercut and the grade is unjustly inflated. Here, Pines connects grade inflation to the undercutting of the purpose of grading itself. I might explain the definition Pines is after here in the following way. Some assignment results in grade inflation when that assignment or assessment increases a student's grade without providing an accurate measure of that student's learning. So why am I highlighting this definition of grade inflation? Well, I think there are two basic points to take from this. First, when explaining a philosophical argument, it will be crucial to define all important terms. This is an essential aspect of completely explaining a philosophical argument, because the way in which an author understands some term can have an effect on how we evaluate his or her argument. In this case, we see that Pine's opposition to easy bonus questions is not just because they raise student grades, although this is something they do, but more fundamentally, he opposes these kinds of questions because he believes they undermine the very purpose of grading itself. This is something important to discuss in your paper because, perhaps, you may want to take issue with that understanding of the purpose of grading in your analysis section when you criticize the argument. The second takeaway point is that this is a good example of why it is important to be familiar with the entire reading and not just the specific stretch of text in which the specified argument occurs. Here we see that Pine's previously explained definition of grade inflation is important for explaining the present argument. Now, let's consider P3 of the argument. Whereas P2 makes a claim about what will result from easy bonus questions, P3 makes a claim about what will result from difficult bonus questions. The claim here is that difficult bonus questions inevitably fail to qualify as extra credit. The basis of this claim is that the only students who will be capable of answering these questions are the best students in the class, or the A students. Pines tells us that, in the case of hard bonus questions, only the A students are able to earn the extra credit points. But these students don't need the points to raise their grades, they are already as high as they can go. So, it would actually fail as an instance of extra credit because it doesn't satisfy the criterion set forth in 2 to increase the student's grade. Because only A students will be able to get difficult questions right, and the grades of A students cannot be raised any higher than they already are, Pines believes that hard questions fail to qualify as extra credit. This is because such questions fail to meet the criterion of extra credit that he outlines early in his article. On page 192, Pines tells us that an extra credit assignment's purpose is to provide an opportunity for a student to increase a grade by performing additional work. So, some assignment qualifies as extra credit only if it provides the opportunity for a student to raise her grade. But difficult bonus questions do not provide the opportunity for students to raise their grade, since the grade of an A student cannot go any higher. Therefore, difficult bonus questions fail to qualify as extra credit. And this is the reasoning that Pines uses in support of premise three. To this point, I've talked through how I would go about 
providing support for each of the premises of Pine's argument. However, there's still an additional further issue that should be discussed. Specifically, you might be wondering, how much time should I spend explaining the support for each premise of the argument? Or perhaps more importantly, do all premises need to be treated equally? Do I need to devote the same amount of time and space in my paper to providing the support for every premise of the argument? Now, the answer to this question is no. And to see why this is, it can be useful to think in terms of two different kinds of premises, controversial premises and non-controversial premises. I define these different kinds of premises in terms of how likely it is that they will be readily accepted by the audience of your paper. A non-controversial premise is a premise for which it would be reasonable for the arguer to expect the agreement of the audience. Or we might say the audience would need little persuading to accept that this premise is true. A controversial premise, on the other hand, is a premise for which it would not be reasonable for the arguer to expect the agreement of the audience. The audience in this case would need significant persuading in order to unanimously or in a sort of consensus way accept that this premise is true. It may be helpful here to look at a particular example. Consider the following argument. Premise 1. It is always morally wrong to intentionally kill another person. Premise 2. The death penalty is an intentional killing of another person. Conclusion. The death penalty is always morally wrong. Let's begin by looking at premise 2. While the question of the morality of the death penalty is quite controversial, this specific premise is not really very controversial at all. No matter what one thinks about the death penalty, whether one thinks it is demanded by justice or if one thinks it's an abuse of state power, all informed parties would or should agree at least that the death penalty does require an intentional ending of another person's life. So, this means that premise 2 would really be a non-controversial premise. Compare this to premise 1. Premise 1 is a very controversial claim. That does not necessarily mean that premise 1 is false. I'm not saying anything one way or another about that here. It just means that many people will hold different opinions about premise 1. Its truth or falsity is by no means obvious. Some will argue that the death penalty is a violation of human rights, it, it, that it is a violation of human rights to intentionally kill another person. Others might argue that doing so is sometimes necessary in certain cases. For example, when defending oneself from an aggressor, or perhaps even more controversially, when the individual in question is someone suffering near the end of their life who does not wish to go on living. In any case, the point just is that there is much more to say about this premise, and I can see reasonable arguments on both sides for or against it. So for that reason, it certainly qualifies as a controversial premise. Now, it should be said that the dividing line between controversial and non-controversial premises is somewhat fluid. To some extent, it is a matter of degree, with some claims being more or less controversial than others. However, this should at least give you a general outline of this concept. Now, why does all of this matter? Well, let's return to the demonstration paper that I've been writing and using as an example. Again, we have space on our outline allotted for explaining each premise of the argument. The question we had previously was, do I need to spend equal time explaining each of these premises? We can now say that the answer is no, and that this is because it is the most controversial premises of the argument that you should spend the most time explaining and providing support for. Some premises, the less controversial premises, you may not need to say very much about. The reason for their truth may be obvious or at least widely agreed upon. However, other premises will be more controversial and not as readily accepted. 
So you should spend more time outlining the reasons the author gives for why that claim is true, or at least the reasons that may be available to us for thinking that claim is true, even if not explicitly stated by the author. To understand this point, let's apply this concept to the present argument. Compare premise 2 and premise 3. Which of these premises is more controversial? Which is less controversial? In this case, I think that premise 2 would be the less controversial premise. I could imagine someone taking issue with this claim, but overall it is not really too controversial to say that easy questions on exams result in great inflation. Premise 3, however, is much more controversial in my view. It relies upon a claim about the purpose of extra credit, the idea that the purpose of extra credit is simply to raise a student's grade, and I think one could certainly take issue with this idea. In fact, in the next video, I will provide some reasons why I think this definition of extra credit may not be quite correct or complete. So, if I was writing this paper, while I would certainly spend time explaining all three premises, I would spend the most time explaining in a detailed fashion the reasons in favor of believing that premise 3 is true. Furthermore, this is something you can explicitly highlight for your reader. For instance, in this case, I begin my explanation of P3 by stating that the most controversial premise of the argument is P3. This is important not just for your explanation section of your paper, but for your analysis section as well. When you eventually critique the argument, it is unlikely you would want to criticize the non-controversial premises of the argument. After all, these are the premises that may very well be obviously correct or true. Instead, what you will be critiquing will be the controversial premise or premises of the argument. Thus, in an effort to present your opponent's argument in as strong a fashion as possible before criticizing it, it will be important to go into the most detail explaining the support for the most controversial premises of that argument. Before ending this video, I again want to take a brief look at the grading rubric and highlight some of the main things I will be looking for when grading the explanation section of your paper. As you can see, your explanation section will be worth 15 points out of a total of 50 points for the paper overall. I also have a grading scale listed here. A grade of 15 out of 15 will require excellent work, perhaps above the level I would likely expect from a beginning philosophy student, 12 points for good work, 8 for average work, and down from there. Grades will also be given in between those categories where appropriate. I also highlight here the primary things I am looking for when grading your explanation section. I want to see that you accurately and completely explain the argument by introducing the topic, making the logical structure of the argument clear, identifying the premises and conclusion of the argument, and explaining in a detailed fashion the support for each premise of the argument with particular attention to those premises that are most controversial. In other words, all of the main points I've covered in this video. Of course, that still leaves the analysis section, and in our next video I will cover guidelines for how to successfully criticize a philosophical argument in that portion of your paper.